Our goal with this event is to provide a platform for women and femmes struggling with mental health and illness who are triumphant. We want to see art and creative pieces in any medium highlighting your experiences or those of a woman or femme whose experiences have inspired you and how you've handled your life and your creativity before or during the pandemic. We are featuring stories highlighting the disparities women and femmes face from all walks of life and how they navigate those challenges while uplifting other women and femmes, giving them hope. In turn, we hope these stories will encourage women and femmes to take the next step forward and to take charge in their lives, stand up for others who are struggling and advocate for change. How can your story positively impact others? One of the marvels of the world is the sight of a soul sitting in prison with the key in its hand. Rumi. I am Justine Rea from Califas. I am an actor, writer for the stage and screen, and painter. My work is motivated by my Chicanx heritage and my experience as a queer woman with chronic GAD and depression. I work with acrylics and canvas. I am inspired by the greatest creative of all, nature. Bones, blood, soil, the elements can be found in my paintings. I love the expanse of human emotion and human restriction, death, fear, love, despair, disgust, social construct. I don't want to turn my face from the fullness of the human experience just because patriarchal fundamentalist systems say that as a marginalized woman I should. So in my artwork I don't. Many people describe my work as transcending and creepy and I like that discomfort because as humans we are beautifully tangled in dualities. We are both the morning and the evening star, both and neither moment to moment. Cultural genocide is not fully acknowledged within the mental health sector. It is barely referenced in the DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is used for diagnosis and treatment of mental health issues in the United States. This has historically led to and continues to lead to neglect, inhumane treatment, and misdiagnosis towards the Chicanx community. I am passionate about raising awareness and advocacy on this matter through my art. My main art piece in Art and Mind is titled Poppies in the Trenches. California is known for the golden poppy, but the actual name of this flower is the Mexican golden poppy. It grows from present-day central Califas down the coast to present-day Mexico. Poppies grow wild where I am from, even when there is little water. Every spring they can be found sprouting from the most difficult places, from dry fields and concrete to cracks in the walls. I am reminded of home, of the perseverance of my community and my culture through this incredible flower. This painting is an embodiment of what an artist I greatly admire, Christopher Rivas, would call the rim of the wound. This black hole where all of these feelings exist, dancing in and out of objectively seeing this wound, sometimes being overwhelmed and engulfed by it, and sometimes right on the edge of it, resistant, succumbing, desperate, purged, and reverent all at once. This painting has a background of burnt sienna. It has a skeleton with half of a woman's face and half of a skull. A bleeding heart is encased by the rib cage with the ribs puncturing it and blood dripping down uh, the sternum onto a silver blade. The blood drips from the blade to a single poppy and travels down into a pool of blood framed uh, by amaranth and more poppies that stretch to the top of the skull.
unfortunately, Jen wasn't able to create an artist's video. Instead, we will be showcasing a previous piece by her in collaboration with Tab and Kate Productions, a dance company in South Carolina. This piece is about severe OCD, previously showcased by LA Mental Health Organization, The Painted Brain, at their Discovering a Place for Us art show. Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, OCD, a three-letter acronym many throw around and perceive as harmless, a mere minor annoyance. OCD is anything but that. It stands for so much more, so much intense pain, tears cried, anxiety-ridden nights and days, battles waged in my mind, lost moments and lost memories. It's an acronym that hides how utterly insidious this disorder is, lurking beneath the surface, waiting for the least opportune time to strike and rip any amount of available fight I had left within me from the last battle. I'm left beaten and bloody, devoid of strength, but still I rise, clean myself up as best I can and wait. I wait, riddled with anxiety, a lacerated heart pounding a million beats per minute on guard for the next time it grabs hold of me. It might be seconds, hours, or days later, but it's guaranteed to come back and play its sinister game with me again. I'll think I'm ready, armed with years of tools and knowledge, but it always has the upper hand, no matter how many times I've engaged with it. The thing about OCD few realize is that it's innate characteristic of attacking the things you love most in life. For me, OCD has morphed itself into many forms throughout the years, but the most agonizing is the intense anxiety and fear my dog is going to die. It mutated into this debilitating obsession several years ago, while my dog was still healthy and relatively young. I'm not sure where or why these thoughts came about, but I couldn't stop them, and I still can't. There were periods of time when the thoughts weren't as penetrating, where I could go, where I could easily push them away, and other times I randomly break down crying for an hour at a time, overcome with obsessions and anxieties. He was on his way out. To lose him has always been my biggest fear. They say a dog is a man's best friend, but for me this is an understatement. He's my life, the reason I've made it through so many periods I swore I'd never pull through. He's the source of so much happiness and laughter, a soft, furry, warm place to cuddle, and a healing source for my soul. I feel we've always been kindred spirits, and he gets and loves me just the way I am, scars and all. Being his mom has never been a chore. It's always come quite easily to me. Herein lies the complexity and depravity of OCD. It exploited all the love and wonderful memories my dog and I have shared and transformed them into such intense, painful obsessions. The fear of him dying has taken me out of the moment, the moment I should be spending with him, too many times to count. It's robbed and tainted the last few years of his life with such relentless, tormenting obsessions and anxieties. Now he's years older, his health has rapidly declined the last eight months and my OCD has intensified to the point of becoming completely debilitating. I analyze and obsess about every move he makes. It's hard enough watching someone you love deteriorate right before your eyes, but I dread coming home after work or waking up in the morning for fear I will find him unable to get up on his own, or worse, dead. I find it hard to leave the house, go to work, or partake in any fun activities with friends for fear he will be all alone suffering and not be alive when I return. Almost every day now is spent in tears because it simply becomes too painful and intense to think about constantly, too much to fight against and too depressing and exhausting to feel like every day I'm losing the war in another day with him. It continues to rob the time I still have left with him, and I know when his time does come, I will never forgive myself for all the moments we could have shared and the memories we could have created if I weren't busy obsessing about losing him. How ironic, counterproductive, and absurd. But hey, that's the nature of the disorder. How beautiful and freeing it must feel to enjoy, to simply enjoy and be present in a moment without being attacked, without fighting endlessly with your mind day in, day out. 
After a lifetime of therapy, I know I'm supposed to fight against my obsessions and anxiety by changing and reframing my thoughts. But old habits don't die easily. Mental battles rarely are won on this front, and some days it gets so bad I guiltily think I'd rather he died so I wouldn't have to obsess about it anymore. Maybe I could have some of my life back. Maybe I wouldn't live in a constant state of anxiety. Of course, this is the last thing I want because I don't know how I'll be able to go on without him. But when you're in your own private hell, the thought seems comforting at times. It's like grieving a loss years before it's even happened. It's losing someone you love so much every day without them ever having left and then waking up and doing it all over again. The good moments and memories are hard to find amidst the heart-wrenching pain, anxiety, and obsessions. They are hidden, like an old chest tucked away for years in the attic. The rest, beneath layers of old, ratty clothes, dust, and dirt, rendering them disguised and difficult to excavate. But I'll keep searching, and I'll tirelessly continue trying to uncover what should have never been forgotten. I won't wave the white flag just yet. I'll keep fighting for my sake and for my dog's sake. I owe him that, seeing how greatly he's enriched my life these past 14 years. My name is Justice Edens, and I am an artist who specializes in character design and illustration. I also work with visual storytelling, and I create both traditionally and digitally. I work with many mediums, but my preferred medium is watercolor. As an artist, I have always wanted to capture the human condition through my stories and characters, and for my whole life I've loved the art of storytelling and visualizing an idea. I have created many characters in the past and many stories as well, however, not many have made it past the concept stages, but um, through creating these characters and these stories, I've learned to utilize this uh, gift to become sort of a coping mechanism for myself, and oftentimes my work reflects this as I tend to project onto my characters and stories, which helps me better understand myself. Sleepless Nights, my main piece, is a perfect example of this. Sleepless Nights represents insomnia and the fear of sleep, and also my own personal experience with sleep as someone who has struggled with physical illness for many months. The piece is entirely devoid of color and only made with black ink and a dip pen. It features a bed with large pointed spikes ripping through the blankets, the pillows, and a stuffed animal. The piece not only shows the impact that physical illness can have on a person's mental state, but also their ability to perform daily intuitive tasks that we take for granted.
Hello, my name is Nabila Nugroho. You might know me as Scale to Seven. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a graphic designer and artist from Indonesia. I usually do design works for branding, social media needs, and mascot characters. But my most notable work is Rebel Girl Maguar. This is my workspace, by the way. I use a standard Wacom to draw, but I decorate mine with stickers. Yay! I have been a creative since I was little, especially drawing. Drawing helps me to unwind from bad days, especially from living in an environment when speaking up is often seen as problematic. It took me some time to find my style though. My anime style was influenced from my love for Japanese cartoons and comics, and my bold line art and colors are the best way for me to express what is mostly on my mind. Art block problem that I experience? Maybe having too much idea to the point I choose to do procrastination. Not a good example, I know. I call this drawing off the market. It depicts Maguire that is surrounded by perfect mannequin woman bodies. Even though she is just a fictional character, the burden of looking perfect still applies to her. Almost the same as what women experience in terms of body standards. You know, it's like a price tag and labels put onto my body from the moment I was born and slowly become an asset when I mature. There is also this expiry date based from age. As I grow older, I often get comments such as, find a boyfriend, you're not getting younger, or you have to get married, if not you find it harder to find a significant other. It's sickening to hear this harmless commentary from people, and what made it worse is that they don't think that kind of remark is rude. Why do they have to put age as way to determine a quality of a human? Lastly, Macquarie at the center with a sad look on her face. She raped her price tag, meaning she finally realized that her worth isn't determined by the male case. She wished that women around her could realize their worth if they change for themselves and not for the patriarchy. Through this artwork, I want to be able to reach those who felt the same. Being constantly compared at the feeling of not owning your own body sucks. The ability to speak up shouldn't be something that is embarrassing and problematic. Everyone is valid to tell about their struggles. I just opened macro shops this year. My first collection ready consists of merchandise inspired from the pandemic. I designed adjustable masks, compact sling bag, and some collectibles such as keychains and stickers. In the future, I would love to do collaborations with local brands and being involved in social campaigns. If you are interested in Macro and me, scan these QR codes. Thank you so much for watching my video and I hope you stay safe wherever you are. Hi, my name is Nikki Lynette. I'm a social impact artist and performer. I do everything. I do everything. <laughs> um, when it comes to my visual art, when I first started creating art at all, it was because there were things I wanted to communicate that I could not express through word or even just journaling. Like my mom would read my diary. So I quickly learned that that was not a way to get out my emotions and so I started putting them in art. The art that I create now is how, it's like my own personal version of art therapy. There are things that I can never say because I don't, I'm not sure if people understand, but I know the people who experience the same things as me. 
they'll understand. So what I put into my art are the nuances of what I go through, the nuances of my emotions, and it's not always pretty. And so healing is an important part of my mental health recovery because I have complex post-traumatic stress disorder. So healing from trauma is the work that I'm up to. And I guess you could say it's kind of the most important part of the work that I'm up to. And through the healing, like I'm having to do some inner child work, I'm trying to deal with some core wounds and that type of thing. And so there's this saying that I've had since I first started going to therapy, when I realized some of my core wounds were the feeling of feeling unloved and feeling unsafe. And so there's this saying, tell me you love me, tell me I'm safe. That became part of how I communicated my needs to other people, right? And at the time, like in the beginning, that was cool. But when you get to a certain point in your healing, you understand it's not about other people telling you that you're loved and you're safe. It's about you understanding for yourself that even by yourself, you are loved and you are safe. Working through emotions through my art is meditative. I'm not a person that's good at meditating, but it has given me clarity an understanding of myself in a way that nothing else does. So I, you know, I'm a multi-hyphenate. I sing, I rap, I write plays, I make films. But I feel very fortunate to be a visual artist too. Cause I feel like all my other things that I do are for other people, but my visual art, that's for me. My main piece uh, describes how I see my process of exercising self-control as a person that's living with a trauma disorder. Like there's a part of me that people don't see that I feel is ugly and kind of dangerous sometimes and it's my responsibility to keep it in check. Uh, the colors that I use are intentionally somewhat muted um, and I used you know like pastels, muted browns, kind of cooler colors than um, I typically use because um, I think that that takes away some of the levity and seriousness from it and makes it slightly a little bit more intimidating um, and the ugliness of the monster kind of belies the cuteness of the character next to it which is me and that's kind of how I feel even about myself. My name is Linlin Yu and I'm an 18 year old incoming freshman at RISD. I'm a self-taught artist with guidance from my dad, my friends, and my various inspirations. I create digital finger illustrations, ink and charcoal drawings, and acrylic, watercolor, and oil paintings. So I'm very excited to further my studies and expressions through different mediums at art school. To me, being an artist is a process and a strive for a place we define ourselves. I believe that we are a work in progress, no matter our age, beliefs, culture, gender, or overall wisdom, because we are continually adapting and learning. A lot of my ideas and work revolve around inclusivity, interactions with nature and intangible threads connecting our society. I dedicate as much passion to being an open-minded artist as I do with being a loyal friend, which extends 
beyond initiating personal and universal conversations to amplify the good in humanity. My main art piece for Art in Mind is titled Pursuit of Promise. It is a digital illustration spotlighting an Asian American woman dressed in a teapot dress as she strides ahead of the light, leaving behind the trail of generations that raised her. Seeking opportunities, freedom, and a life not yet certain, she prides herself as an immigrant from China to America, accompanied by the aroma of childhood delicacies and the nostalgia of her homeland. She holds an expression of perseverance as though simple sacrifices do not suffice. She is not only my mother, but a mother for many. And I aim to share a personal yet universal capsule on my own identity through this bold and colorful painting and promote awareness for mental health that can reach people in and out of the AAPI community. Thank you so much for listening. Hi everybody, this is Jailen Salah, you can call me Jay. Uh, I'm the poet uh, participating in Art and Mind project with uh, my poem uh, I Stalk the Man Who Assaulted Me on Facebook. Um, I wrote this poem inspired by some of the experiences that happened to me in the workplaces where I have been uh, employed multiple times. I faced misogyny and sexual discrimination and I faced um, predatory behavior by some of my male superiors and I just wanted to express myself in that way to evoke certain emotions in women who have dealt with certain situations and weren't able to express themselves or talk about it because I have talked about it lately as I became to terms with my trauma. Uh, the poem kind of exploits our modern society where as women we are sometimes faced with the fact that we cannot take matters into our own hands, we cannot uh, take our rights or give ourselves the credit that we deserve. Um, and through the poem, I really wanted to show how brutal it is to just be in this world of the social media where you're constantly bombarded with pictures and videos of people who have harmed you and yet you cannot go after them in the proper way. Uh, I live in Alexandria, Egypt, which is a very ancient town. It's known for its cultural diversity and the cosmopolitan atmosphere, especially back in the day in the 50s and 60s and way, way back when it was the place where Greeks would just um, exhibit all the culture and all the art and that. I'm Egyptian, but I write in English all the time. I really hope you enjoy uh, reading my poem and watching the accompanying art piece by Amaranthia, my friend, and of course the dance performance by two very talented dancers. Uh, thanks. Due to unforeseen circumstances, the two dancers were replaced with a short film concept.
I stalked the man who assaulted me on Facebook. The man who assaulted me on my way to the restrooms at my workplace has a Facebook that he constantly updates with hails to Jesus, accomplishments in Candy Crush, and songs about being the perfect man. I stalk him on his social I media him on at his night. Social he's at a bar drinking media. tequila, spiking the drinks of unseen girls whose bad luck puts them drunkenly in his way. He spiked my drink, but didn't get near. My foreboding stature, my hectic brain, and trimmed armpit hair stopped him. I stood ahead of my time, madly in love with a predator, unaware that his claws, as he clapped my back, were leaving marks of undeniable hunger. The man who threw himself at me before the morning meeting updates his Facebook regularly, writing verses from the Bible, stalking younger girls. The man who recruits victims to recruit younger preys, like me, vanishes into thin air when someone asks on messenger what he's doing. The man who prays in the morning and drinks himself to blindness at night comes to work hungover and pulls the strap of my bra. The man whose voice sends shivers in my spine left a laughing emoji under a cute post that a cute girl wrote about college humor. I stalk men who assault me on social media and block them I if they tweet on social me. issues me. feminism or free in countries I under occupation. If he shares the pride flag, media. I know he is closeted and frustrated in his own body. If he stands in solidarity with oppressed minorities, I slam my door in his face. I send a report to Facebook. What do you call imposters who support causes while forming clauses with the pussies of girls? They silently probe. There is no definition for chaotic wisdom. Commonly appreciated assholes, shiny men in shiny suits, smiling to the world while keeping naked girls and gay boys locked in their basements to feed on them after long hours in the air-conditioned office and air-freshened halls. I stalk the men who slowly my left my soul to wither in the aftermath of darkness they gifted me. I'm Amaranthia Sipia, a 21-year-old Black disabled activist, creative, and creator of Art in Mind, based in New Hampshire. Ink pens combined with my digital art are my primary medium. My work focuses on using comic art and illustration to highlight Black mental health disparities and my experiences with PTSD, GAD, and agoraphobia related to racial trauma. For those who don't know, agoraphobia is an anxiety disorder that causes severe anxiety in public and crowded spaces, in particular when no one is with you, leading to avoidance. My early childhood heavily influences my artwork. I lived in Tokyo, Japan between 4 and 6 and attended international school. Living in a Buddhist and Shinto society while being born into Japanese Buddhism caused my artwork to be heavily influenced by spirituality, Japanese mythology, and Buddhist philosophy. Tezuka Osamu is my main influence. He was the creator of Astro Boy and Blackjack. I'm inspired by how he experimented with unusual and sometimes exaggerated character designs and concepts to tell stories from a humanist perspective. When I was a child model in Japan, I modeled for Tezuka Productions Save the Glass Earth fashion show, but I didn't know who Tezuka was until I turned 14. I rediscovered the photos at 17 and I couldn't believe it. After returning from Japan, the reverse culture shock was severe. I was always the odd one out. Being one of the only black girls in an all-white school, especially a black girl who was part of a religious minority, made it so my only reliable friend was art. At age 13, I became homeschooled online due to severe racial trauma and bullying. 
I always tried to connect back to Japanese culture as it was my second comfort. I love making character designs and concept art for comics, although I haven't had time for it recently. A hobby of mine is creating fantasy art. The first comic project I made at eight years old, Legend of Shintaro, is a great example of that. The main thing I'm known for is my super shy bunny character, Sarah, aka Emo Bunny. Emo Bunny is my comic project that I created after receiving my diagnosis of Generalized Anxiety Disorder, or GAD, in 2017. I barely saw any examples of black girls coping with and overcoming anxiety, so I decided to create Sarah as a way to express my experiences. Her emotional support cat, Serenity, comforts her, helping her overcome her struggle with anxiety and depression. Her anxiety is personified as a monster whose power increases as she becomes more stressed. My main art piece, Protect Black Woman, is part of a series I made with my mom called Celebrating Shades of Black Beauty, or Curls and Curves. It mixes my illustrations with her digital paintings, dubbed Sun Angels. Curls and Curves is the first piece in the series, and it focuses on embracing dark skin, large curvy bodies, and luxurious, natural kinky hair. Protect Black Woman has been in development for 10 months. While making it, a lot of emotional turmoil emerged ultimately leading to several months of depression and art block due to the pandemic. The piece has a soft yellow watercolor background with vivid paintbrush strokes of mustard tones. Black women with large, luxurious, vibrant, kinky hair speckled with all colors of the rainbow are lined up in three rows. Each row of women spells out a word with their bodies. Each body is a different curvaceous shape and size. The first row spells out protect, the second row says black, and the third row says women. All the women have abstract patterns on their bodies, including swirls, stripes, squares, circular patterns, and more. The patterns are filled with shades of brown skin tones, with vibrant shades of yellows, purples, golds, reds, and blues to accentuate the browns. One woman has albinism, Another has vitilago, and the last woman is an amputee with a prosthetic leg. Many black women are neglected, lost, and can never find an accepting and empathetic place. A place not to feel like we have to handle constant burdens. We're unprotected, and it's painful to see and experience firsthand. So many black and non-black male idols get away with the mistreatment of black women and girls. My mom and I feel like we're floating, and when we find a place that might be accepting, we're fearful that it's just an illusion. If the black community doesn't protect us and take accountability for hypermasculinity and homophobia, then who will? According to the BlackburnCenter.org article, Black Women and Domestic Violence, 40% of black women will face domestic violence versus 31.5% of women overall. 53.8% of black women have experienced psychological abuse and 41.2% are survivors of physical abuse. We are 2.5 times more likely to be murdered by men. These killings are 92% interracial. It is the number one health issue plaguing black women. As seen by this statistic, this isn't just a personal experience. It is a fact that black women are undervalued and unprotected, even by our own community. In creating Protect Black Women, this piece brought up so much memories and so much trauma and so much pain for me because as an older black woman, I stand here and I have, literally, I can count the black women that are still, that I'm still connected to on one hand. Older black women consider a person like me radical because I don't buy into the beliefs they have about how I should be as a 
black woman, how I should raise my daughter as a black woman, what I should look like, what I should wear, what kind of man I should have. Um, I shouldn't be with, a, I should be choosing men to, to um, be the sole protector of me. I am just so tired of it. And this whole Bill Cosby thing really annoyed the hell out of me because I, as an older black woman, I don't buy into the nonsense that I should protect a man, my black man, even though he might be hurting my family or he might be hurting my children. I don't buy into that nonsense. I feel that we should stand up and speak out when we see black men doing things that are harmful to the family because the only way we get better is if we speak up about what is wrong to make it right. And an article um, in the Grio really struck a chord with me. It's called Not My Auntie, How Some Older Black Women Fail Black Women and Girls by Shanna Pinnock. And it says, I'm going to read from it because it says everything. It is in, these are quotes that I took out of it. It is in, it's in women who hold steadfast to respectability politics so deeply entrenched in white supremacy and whitewashing that then the rest of us who dare to step outside of those stifling expectations we never asked for that we somehow do not respect ourselves. The toxicity among older generations of black women is alive and well that the generation that bred the lights of Audre Lord, Toni Morrison, Angela Davis, and other fierce black women is still holding on tight to the shackles of patriarchy and misogyny. The toxicity lingers in the aunties who are proud R. Kelly supporters who would rather comment on fast, quote unquote, fast, fast tail girls than the male predators who groom and abuse them. It lingers in the aunties, mothers and grandmothers who prefer to villainize victims because they are more concerned about optics, quote unquote, and not letting quote unquote family build business red protect black men at all costs out in public. It's the same toxic cycle that allows for those women to never report the predators in our own families, instead choosing to quietly warn family members not to leave children alone with the offended, offending relative, but still encouraging children to go give relative, the relative a hug. We've seen the harm manifesting the blatant valuing of sons over daughters in church going, quote unquote, older women encouraging other women to stay in mentally, emotionally, and or physically abusive relationships because having an abusive man is better than no man at all. So says the Lord. Not to mention the rampant homophobia and transphobia permeating our culture. All this I have found true walking in these shoes as a 58-year-old 58 58 year woman.